Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Trumpet Daily. This week, we passed the five-year anniversary of President Obama's historic speech in Cairo. It was supposed to mark a new beginning in U.S.-Islamic relations. It was supposed to improve America's standing in the world while bringing peace and stability to the Middle East and North Africa. But none of this has happened. I just want to remind you of what my father wrote back in June 2009 in the Trumpet magazine. He commented on the impact the Cairo speech would have on the flow of prophetic events. He said, President Obama's speech is a great turning point in this world. It is going to play a major role in terrifying prophecies of your Bible being fulfilled. Now, since that was written, we've seen the Middle East go up in flames. In Egypt, we abandoned a staunch American ally and handed the nation over to religious extremists. In Libya, we illegally bombed Gaddafi into submission, but we failed to launch even one bomb in defense of our consulate in Benghazi when it came under attack in 2012. With respect to Iran, America has all but ignored popular democratic uprisings while consistently lending support for the radical Islamic regime, defending its nuclear program, negotiating secret deals that undermine Israel's security, propping up the Rouhani administration as moderate and peaceful. We claim to have Al-Qaeda on the run, and then we watch as our embassies come under fire all across the region. We claim victory in Iraq, withdraw the troops, and then Iran, the number one state sponsor of terror, takes over. Now we've promised to leave Afghanistan, but not before propping up the very regime that we took down after 9-11. The great paradox in all of this is that the current administration in Washington began by saying it would fix all the foreign policy blunders of the previous administration. But the plain truth is, America is now in a fix that is much worse than it was five years ago. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. And he said unto me, you must prophesy again. The heavy cost of America's policy of appeasement has certainly escalated dramatically over the past week. On Monday, of course, the United States announced that it would work with and pay for the new Palestinian government, which now includes Hamas. And following that quick endorsement, we then learned later in the week that America had been holding these secret back-channel talks with Hamas for about six months. And then, of course, added to all of this with Hamas and the, the Palestinians, there has been the illegal and, and lopsided prisoner exchange, which we talked about earlier in the week. And, of course, it's been all over the news here in the United States. And another interesting angle to this story uh, that's been covered by a few outlets uh, talks about members of com Congress and, and uh, how concerned they are now that the release of these five senior Taliban commanders uh, might be just the beginning of President Obama's attempt to empty out the facility in Guantanamo Bay so that he can finally close it. And of course this has been a promise that he, he made even before he became president, back when he was campaigning and one of his first acts as president in 2009 was to say that he would close it by the end of the year. This is from, I believe, the State of the Union address, where it was shortly after he came into office. Uh, he said Guantanamo will be closed no later than one year from now. That, I believe, was an executive order, actually. So he set that as a goal right from the start, to be closed no later than a year from now. Later on in that same year, May of 2009, he said the existence of Guantanamo created terrorists. It is a rallying cry for our enemies. So he made his position clear from the get-go that this was something that 
we had to get rid of because it was only uh, a rallying cry for the Taliban and other extremist forces around the world. The fact that we had all of these killers, cold-blooded killers, locked up at Gitmo, as it's uh, often called. Another quote, this more recently, earlier this year, State of the Union 2014, back in January, he said, and with the Afghan war ending, this needs to be the year Congress lifts the remaining restrictions on uh, detainee transfers and we close the prison at Guantanamo Bay. Now on the Trumpet Daily Monday, we went back and looked at that legislation that uh, Mr. Obama signed into law back in December of 2013, uh, but how he followed that up with a, a presidential uh, signing order or paper, whatever those are called, and said that you know, while he, he uh, uh, liked the direction that Congress was going in, there still were too many restrictions on him to act on what he wants to do there with, uh, with Guantanamo. And so this, I think, gives you some of the important background uh, leading up to the events of this past week, where, as you now know, this administration went right around Congress, even though it was planning for this release uh, for many months. It went right around Congress and let go of uh, really the, the top generals uh, of the Taliban. And the administration, of course, since has gotten quite a lot of flack um, from Republicans in particular, but really from quite a few, of, I mean, quite a lot of America. When you look at the outcry that there has been here in the United States, this is from uh, the Daily Beast, Josh Rogan, writing about the significance, in his view, of this release of those five uh, terrorists. He says Obama now has seven months to fulfill his latest promise to shut down Guantanamo or come as close to it as he can. Now there's growing concern on Capitol Hill that President Obama intends to bypass Congress to fulfill his promise to close the prison by releasing scores of more Guantanamo prisoners with little public or even private debate. And of course he's been setting the tone for this, as I said in recent months, really over the last year, year and a half, where he's repeatedly said, if Congress doesn't act or if Congress doesn't get out of the way, you can expect for me to do what needs to be done to follow up on my promises. It is, as I say, I mean, even the New York Times today uh, gave quite a few details about the deal from this past week, the prisoner exchange, and what was going on there for many months, and yet evidently through it all, uh, they couldn't uh, tell anyone in Congress what was happening, which is why so many politicians are upset. And of course the excuses early on that the prisoner over there was sick and needed to get back in and they had a chance for a deal and they couldn't stop or wait or take the time to alert Congress. Uh, but now, of course, many are calling those excuses into question saying that they were just that, excuses, and that the reason he went around Congress is because he knew, he knew Congress wouldn't approve of it. This uh, continues, says this whole deal may have been uh, a test to see how far the administration can actually push it, and if Congress doesn't fight back, they will feel more empowered to move forward with additional transfers. It says uh, they've lined up all the dominoes to be able to move a lot more detainees out of Guantanamo, and this could be just the beginning. It could be the beginning. And really, I think a case could be made, although I haven't read this from a lot of sources, that if you take out the worst of the lot, there's about, I think there's 149 detainees left, but if you get rid of the, the worst, and you'd have to say those five that were released last week uh, were probably right at the top of the list of the worst of the lot, then the case becomes easier uh, to move the others wherever they may be moved to, who knows? But of course, that's the goal. And it's not like this is some clandestine effort. I mean, that's been the goal and it's been clearly stated from the very beginning of his presidency, even before, as I said, continuing from this article, it says lawmakers and staffers see the Bergdahl case as only the latest maneuver in a larger plan to cut Congress out of the Guantanamo issue. And they're not exactly reassured by senior administration officials' refusal to disclose what steps will be taken to mitigate the risk that these prisoners could become involved again in the Afghan uh, insurgency. And in fact, on that point, 
that was something uh, on his, his trip this week to Poland the president commented on, even saying that he, you know, that was a possibility that these commanders could return right to the battlefield. This is a clip from uh, a press conference. I believe this was on Tuesday. Uh, is there the possibility of uh, some of them trying to return to uh, activities that are detrimental to us? Absolutely. That's been true of all the prisoners that were released from Guantanamo. There is a certain recidivism rate that takes place. So he said that in Poland, as I said, and it's interesting if you take that comment and compare it to other comments that he made as to the prisoner exchange and how that, well, when you come to the end of a war, he compared himself to Washington and Lincoln and said that when you get to the end of a war, this is what you do. You return the prisoners. And so in the one, I mean, on the one hand, he says the war is over. We've got to return the prisoners. On the other hand, he's saying there's a very clear possibility that they could return to the battlefield and that they could resume their attacks. But the plan, as the administration has made clear, is to move forward with getting rid of the detainees, putting an end to the operation in Afghanistan, calling an end to the, the war against terrorism. Meanwhile, you have the Taliban, of course, saying we're at war against the United States and, and uh, actually we're inspired by what's transpired. And we're eager to get more soldiers, to kidnap more, because it works out pretty well for us. Let me just uh, show you what uh, Senator Harry Reid said uh, this past week as well. Uh, this is the Senate Majority Leader talking about these five that were let go. He says Guantanamo has been there far too long. And then he went on to say later, and I think that we should get get them out, of, out there of as quickly as, as we can. We have been uh, uh, held up from doing that by the Republicans, not wanting any of them to be tried here in the United States, even though our record here is really quite good. He says, so I'm glad, I'm glad to get rid of these five people. Send them back to Qatar. So he's glad to get rid of them. But of course, you can make a serious case that you're not getting rid of them by letting them go. I mean, where are they going to? they're actually posing a much greater threat now because they're on the loose. They're in Qatar, and where do they go from there? What happens after the travel ban ends, as we covered earlier this week? But, I mean, the reason why this, this quote is so important is it reflects the thinking. He's been right in step with the administration on so many issues over the past year or two. And I think it really does reflect the thinking in this administration in that, well, I'm glad they're gone. Guantanamo's been there long enough. We need to get rid of them. That's the thinking. The problem is you can't get rid of them. That's one reason why the, the detention facility is still there because nobody wants them. Nobody wants to take them. None of the states in, in America here want them. Congress doesn't want to see it moved. Other nations, are they just going to welcome them in? Well, perhaps ones in the Middle East that would welcome them home. It reveals a lot about the thinking. It really is just a bizarre and frightening way to view that facility. Whether people want to have it or not. I mean, these are hardened killers with, as I said Monday, with a lot of blood on their hands. And uh, in that same New York Times article from this morning, by the way, it talked about releasing uh, these aging um, prisoners, implying that, well, you know, 10 years, 12 years have passed, and they're old now. I suppose they won't pose much of a threat. Well, I guess we'll see. As if they're incapable, all of a sudden, of uh, commanding terrorists of giving orders like they did before they were caught that lead to the deaths of, well, many thousands if you add all the, the Afghans that they killed. Another piece that talked about uh, the Guantanamo angle to the events of this last week, this is Politico, June 2nd, says it's Obama's most assertive move to shrink Guantanamo's population since U.S. Embassy bombing suspect uh, Ahmad Gilani was flown from the island prison to New York City under cover of darkness. 
that's back in 2009, it says, and it sends a clear message, as liberals and some conservatives have long urged, Obama's now willing to wield his executive powers to get the job done. It says the transfer of the five Taliban prisoners fulfilled to an extent a fantasy long held by Guantanamo closure advocates that the president would take an important symbolic step toward closure by ignoring or overriding congressional restrictions piled on by lawmakers in recent years. Lawmakers have piled them on because they don't want to see those detainees disappear. They know that by opening the doors of their prison cell, that that's not going to get rid of them. That's just going to put more American lives in danger. As I said, the number's already been whittled down to 149. And if you get rid of some of the worst of them, how much longer? before the entire facility is empty and closed. And it all kind of fits, doesn't it? Afghanistan operations are about to end. The war is over. And, well, we'll see if the enemy uh, believes the same thing, that political peace continues. The administration believes that whittling down the Guantanamo population will make closure more manageable. Despite the daunting challenges, Obama said in an interview last week before the Bergdahl Link detainee transfer, that he's determined to make closing Guantanamo part of his legacy. He said that last week, even before the news broke about the Bergdahl switch or swap. This is part of his legacy. I mean, this is something that he and the members of his administration see as a success. They see the swap as a success. That's why there's been no apology except for a small one that they, well, they should have told a, a couple of people in Congress. But outside of that, there's been no apology for the fact that they swapped these five hardened terrorists for someone that deserted the U.S. Army, and, and possibly worse, maybe collaborated with the enemy. Those are seen as successes. Daniel chapter 11, let's just look at a few scriptures you're well familiar with, if you've followed us. For very long. The timing, again, reiterating that promise uh, in uh, the State of the Union address to close down the facility, then stating it again last week that he wanted this as part of his legacy. He talked about it at the speech at West Point as well. And now he's moving on it. Now there's some action that's being taken. This is Daniel 11, verse 40, it says, and at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. We've talked often about uh, the king of the north, uh, that beast power coming out of Europe, and the king of the south, that radical Islam headed by Iran. But just as significant as both of those in this clash are, I mean, you also have the fact that the United States is not mentioned here, and that's because of the direction that we're, we're seeing the U.S. head in now. Again, for an administration to come in and to say, we're going to fix all these problems, these mistakes of the previous administration, and yet look at the world today, even compared to five, six years ago. Forget about before 9-11, but just look at it and compare it to what it was five, six years ago. It's not to say that the previous administration had all of these great successes, there were lots of blunders there as well. But it's, it's just gone from bad to worse. That's the point. And, and anyone should be able to see that if you have, I mean, if you take an objective look at what's happening. Verse 41. He shall enter into the glorious land, and many countries shall, shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. It says, he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. See, it's because of this that we were saying for many, many years that Egypt was going to swing over into the, the radical Islamist camp. And there's still some details to sort out there, but look at how, I mean, look at how unstable Egypt is. I mean, Egypt's fallen back to page 48 of the newspaper because of all these other events. And it's still unstable. It's still being really controlled by the forces of radical Islam in many ways. And it's only going to go more in that direction. 
because of the events of these past few years. It's not going to get better. Verse 43, it says, But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and over, over the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. Libya and Ethiopia. I mean, after the, the, the so-called Arab Spring, starting in Tunisia and then spreading into Egypt and so on, everyone was saying, well, who's next, Yemen or some other group? And here this little church back in 2011 was talking about, well, you need to be looking at Libya. You need to be watching Libya. And then sure enough, here's the bombing campaign, U.S.-led bombing campaign that takes out Gaddafi and then just opens the way for the radical forces of Islam to take over. And if you didn't believe that that was happening in 2011, then when 9-11 when happened in 2012 and Americans are getting killed in Benghazi, well, that should have been a wake-up call. We handed it over to the radicals and we were telling you about that radical swing right at the early stages of the, the Arab Spring. So much of these events, if, if, if you're honest, I mean, they were brought on or at least hastened by this, this uh, Muslim outreach in 2009, there at the beginning of the current administration. This is uh, going back to that article about the Cairo speech that my father wrote in June 2009. He said, how much did America's president help the terrorist cause? Talking about the speech. I mean, how, how much did this help the terrorists? He says, probably far more than we can imagine. President Obama's speech is a great turning point in this world. I read this at the top. He says, it's going to play a major role in terrifying prophecies of your Bible being fulfilled. It will play a major role in these prophecies being fulfilled. Let's just look at a couple more verses in Luke chapter 21, the Gospel of Luke chapter 21. Now you look back, not just at the last five years, look back to the start of the war against terrorism, 9-11, 2001, and we've talked to you before about uh, what my father had said at the start of that year, that we had entered into, prophetically speaking, the last hour, and then just a few months later, we have the explosions on 9-11 and the beginning of the war against terrorism and all the articles that we wrote early on about how that this was a war America would eventually lose, sad to say. How much have we accomplished in this war against terrorism? What in the end, do we have to show for it? We get to the end of the road here, quote unquote. Uh, Guantanamo's closed. Uh, the operation in Afghanistan's over. We're out of Iraq. Uh, the Middle East has exploded, but never mind that. We hand it over to the radicals in Libya, in Egypt, and elsewhere. Syria is exploding in civil war. We had a plan for that, but uh, couldn't follow through on it. I mean, in the end, what are we going to have to show for it? That's what people should be wondering right now. That's what people should be asking. And if that's where we are at the end of this long and difficult struggle, I mean, what's it going to be like in the years ahead? The enemies of America are not going to lay down their weapons just because we close a detention facility or just because we hand over some prisoners. As Time Magazine said today, we're inspired to kidnap more. Look at the gains, as I said on Monday. I mean, it sends a direct message to the enemies of America that if you kidnap or if you commit acts of terror, it will yield results. That's the message that it sends. Another point that was made at Powerline uh, just today or the other day. It says Obama's desire to make deals with America's worst enemies is a unifying theme of his presidency. He brought up at Powerline how that one of the reasons why that this, this swap happened so quickly, as some have said, is because of the detention facility and the fact that he wants to close it down. But then he brings up this point, a, a, another reason why he, he was so eager, so quick to hand over the five. It says he made one with, he's talking about all these desires to make deals with others 
He made one with Iran over its nuclear program. He made one with Assad over chemical weapons brokered by our adversary Putin. He brokered a ceasefire deal with Hamas through Morsi, the Muslim Brotherhood man. Indeed, President Obama has long sought deals with the Taliban. The five commanders at Gitmo were the main stumbling block, no longer. And so now the door's open to uh, come into the negotiating room and to sit down with the Taliban, just like we've sat down with the Iranians, just like we've sat down with Hamas, just like we've sat down with the Muslim Brotherhood. And we're about to find out if, it, if, if it's worked. Well, you know it hasn't. <laughs> you know it hasn't. But the fruits that are going to come from this later, they're not going to be pleasant. This is Luke 21 and verse 24. It says, uh, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. See, most people are just, just totally blind to what's coming, unconcerned about what's happening in the world. Even people that are up in arms over the prisoner swap and how lopsided it was or the, the shady background of the, the American POW. They really don't see the bigger picture here of what's happening geopolitically, of what's happening to America standing in the world, of the explosions that are coming because of America's weakness, because of America's uh, willingness to prop up traditional enemies. Few people are aware of what's really, really happening. Verse 35, it says, For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. You see, it's going to happen just suddenly, just like a snare, like a trap. One last quote from that June 2009 article that my, uh, my father wrote. President Obama thinks that through his words he will have peace with Iran, but after the, the terrorists heard that speech, speaking of the Cairo speech, they had to be rejoicing. When America's president gives a speech like that, the terrorists have contempt for such weakness and are stirred to fight even harder. They can smell the victory. Think about, again, that Time Magazine article. They're inspired to kidnap all the more when they sense weakness, when they hear weakness like this. They're just that much more stirred to fight, as he says there. And then finally, he says, so we can expect, we can expect violent terrorism to intensify and shake the nations. We won't have long to wait to see who is right. We won't have much longer to wait to see if the nations are going to shake all the more because of events that have happened in recent years. Finally, then, verse 36, it says, Watch you therefore, this is Jesus speaking to the disciples, and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Watch! And pray, watch world events, and pray always that you might be ready for what's coming. I want to refer you to that article once again. This is from June, June 22nd. It says there, 2009, at thetrumpet.com. Just go to thetrumpet.com now and, and uh, run a search on that particular title. How President Obama's Cairo speech will shake the nations. Go back and read that. It's a real eye-opener. As I said, we just passed the five-year anniversary of that speech. And what a dangerous world we now live in as a result. I want to also refer you to the latest Trumpet magazine on the lost identity, America's lost identity. In this, in this issue, by the way, there's a, an e-book that you can uh, learn about on how you can understand Bible prophecy. Jesus, after all, said, watch and pray always. Watch world events. If you sign up for a free subscription to this, uh, this magazine, we'll send it to you monthly. And, uh, of course, in reading these articles, you can find out how to secure uh, a lot of other free material, like that ebook on how to understand Bible prophecy. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you next time on The Trumpet Daily.